Thank you, my brother. When I get up to speak, I never have a clue what's going to happen. So I'm going to ask you to do something because I'm aware that if the Spirit of God doesn't speak through me today, then the next 30 minutes is going to be a colossal waste of time. I really do believe that. <clears throat> sometimes something happens real good, sometimes not much happens, but I'm going to ask you to, for the next 30 seconds, would all seven or eight or nine thousand of you, would you, just for 30 seconds, would you pray out loud for me? And I'll pray for you. That's about 10,000 to one. I appreciate the odds here. But I'd like you just to pray out loud for me as I deliver what I believe the Lord has put on my heart. So for just 30 seconds, I'll time you. Just, just where, you're, where you're sitting, turn to your friend, whatever, but just, just whisper a prayer. Just pray out loud. I'd like to hear the voices of all of you praying for me. Start, please, 30 seconds. Lord, you're hearing these prayers. We sang earlier to wait upon the Lord. That's what I want to do now as I share what you've put on my heart. I pray for your spirit's movement through me. All the junk that's inside of me, override it. And release what's in me that's of yourself. For I pray it in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> a week ago today, last Monday, as I set aside most of the day to begin preparing for seeing what God would have me share with you today, I found myself noticing as I was in my desk in the downstairs area of our home where I have a little office, I, I found myself noticing a, a small framed photograph that was hanging on the wall behind my desk, in fact, a picture that I've seen a thousand times before, but, but I had this strange sense just a week ago as I looked at this particular picture that, that God's Spirit was stirring something in me. Now I have a bit of a bad habit. I, I never speak from old notes. I have a couple of pages of thoughts that I've written out. I wrote them out this morning. I never speak from old notes, so I always feel when I get up to speak, and I have a chance to speak a lot in different places, but I always feel a, a nervous pressure to come up with something that's fresh. Because I've come to realize, because I've tried it many times, and not many times, but sometimes, I've realized that an old message that worked before doesn't always work again. It has to be somehow alive within me. So I was praying last Monday, God, will you, will you lay on my heart something that I can stand before this group of Liberty students and have some sense that this is the message you want me to give to this group on this particular day. And in order to do that, I always find myself searching for my center. What is going on in the core of my soul where the Holy Spirit actually lives? I take that very seriously, that the Spirit of God lives within me. And if I can discover what is alive within me as I read the Scripture, as I pray, as I think about a message that's going to be coming up, then perhaps I can have some confidence that the Spirit of God might do something as I get up and chat with you all for a couple of minutes. So I go on a search to search for my center by staying alert to whatever seems most alive within me as I pray and read and think and look. And last Monday, as I looked at this picture, something inside of me was stirring. It's a picture taken by my wife 20 years ago. I was in my mid-40s and I was standing next to a gentleman in his 80s. And in the picture, we're leaning against a waist-high stone wall on the Cape of Good Hope in Cape Town, South Africa. Where two oceans are meeting, it's a beautiful sight. Some of you have been there apparently. And in this picture, this older gentleman and myself are looking together at the sheer beauty of the scene. And it was while I was standing there as I looked at the picture again last Monday morning, that very vividly I recalled one of the most paradigm changing, significant conversations that I've had in my 66 years. And I thought, as this memory came back to me looking at this picture, that maybe, maybe God's Spirit is uh, awakening something within me that He wants me to talk about with you all today. I have learned one, one thing, that when you search for the center, it takes you through a lot of ugly junk inside of yourself. 
When you search for what the Spirit of God is doing in your life, you have to cut through. You've got to pierce through some of the insecurities and the fears and the demanding spirit and, and all the, the pride and the impatience, all sorts of fleshly things that, after knowing Jesus now for almost 60 years, are still very much alive with inside of me. So I geared up for the exposure of what's ugly within me as I look for the spiritual life that's fully alive within me. So I pondered that picture, and here's what came to my mind. I, I realized that that picture was taken, as I indicated, 20 years ago. And the week before that picture was taken in Cape Town, I had led a conference in Johannesburg. And after leading this conference in Johannesburg, my wife and I had opportunity to take a long walk through the town of Soweto. Have you heard of Soweto? It's one of the poorest cities in the world. And we walked through the city of, I don't know how many thousands upon thousands of families that were gathered together in tin huts, about 10 by 10, no running water, dirt floors, miserable living conditions. And as my wife and I were walking through this incredibly discouraging, depressing, difficult place, a, a young boy, maybe about 15 years of age, came up to me and in broken English, grabbed my arm, and he said this to me, he says, would you please tell your friends in America how we live? We need your help. And at that moment, I wanted to quit counseling well-fed Americans. At that moment, I wanted to quit working with people who were living so comfortably like I live. And I, want to stop being, I wanted to stop being a crazy psychologist who was somewhat psychobabble in me to try to help people feel better about themselves when they're already doing really quite well. And I really found myself wanting to organize some sort of a relief effort to that to relieve that boy's sufferings and to be good in some way to reflect the love of Jesus to all those image bearers in Soweto. Well, a week later, after being overwhelmed by the suffering of the folks in that particular city, I was in Cape Town leaning against this waist-high stone wall with this man in his 80s, a man who was regarded by many as the finest theological mind alive in his day. His name is David Broughton Knox, Dr. David Broughton Knox. And he was the principal of Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia for a number of years, considered one of the most renowned theological institutions in the world. I knew Dr. Knox a little bit. as an incredibly compassionate, gentle, kind man, as well as a brilliant scholar. And as I looked at this picture last Monday, I remembered that I felt at that time, and felt it again just last week, I felt at that time just immobilized between the beauty of God's creation at the Cape of Good Hope and the ugliness of all the suffering of God's children in a place like Soweto. And overwhelmed by that, I, I, I turned to Dr. Knox, still looking at the oceans in front of us, and, and I asked him this very obvious question, I suppose. I said, Dr. Knox, are you, are you ever overwhelmed by the suffering in this world? And I expected him to say something like this, Larry, every day I'm overwhelmed by how people suffer in this world. You told me, Larry, about this boy that grabbed your arm. Let me tell you what my response is to that. I hope you go home and organize a missions trip in your church. I hope you supply a food bank. I hope you organize medical people to come to help the folks in Soweto. Be a missional Christian, relieve their suffering. That's what I expected and really kind of wanted him to say, but that's not what he said. When I asked Dr. Knox, are you ever just overwhelmed by the suffering and the world that's all around us in this desperately sad world, Dr. Knox surprised me. He paused for a moment, eyes now looking up a little bit at the blue sky. I'll never forget the moment. And he quietly said in answer to my question, are you ever overwhelmed by the suffering of this world? He simply said very quietly and gently, he said, no. I thought, what? What's the matter with you? He didn't say it out loud, of course. And when he said no, he paused a minute and then much more quietly he said these words. And this, th these words have changed my approach to counseling. They've changed my approach to relating. He said this, no, I'm not overwhelmed by the suffering in the world. Yes, I heard over it, but I am overwhelmed by the fact that God bothered to do anything about it. That one sentence did something in me. But at the time, as I look back on that moment that, that the picture captured, 
At the time, I remember his comment irritated me. It made me kind of angry. I, I maintained respectful silence in the presence of this brilliant scholar, but inside I was really kind of screaming. And I was saying, isn't God supposed to do something? What are you surprised by? A loving God doing something about the suffering. You shouldn't be surprised by that. You ought to expect that. You shouldn't be overwhelmed by that. You should assume that. Isn't that God's job? Isn't it God's job to cure people's cancer? Isn't it God's job to relieve human suffering? Isn't it God's job to feed the hungry? And doesn't he want us to be his arms and legs in doing that? But frankly, as I was thinking to myself in response to his comment, I was thinking, I, I know we're supposed to be doing that, but I can't see why you're so overwhelmed by the fact that God's doing anything about it. That's his job. And frankly, if I were honest with you, I would have to say he could be doing a better job. And I was more irritated than overwhelmed. Well, I recalled that conversation last Monday and just sat back and pondered that just a week ago today. That memory triggered an earlier conversation, another conversation that shaped my thinking. And this one took place 36 years ago when I was 30 years old and another chat with an elder gentleman, Dr. William Hendrickson, a renowned scholar, Greek scholar, had written many commentaries and New Testament epistles, was preaching at our church. And I, um, I asked for the opportunity to have lunch with him. So he graciously agreed, and we met for lunch at a tent little place called Boca Raton, Florida. Mm. And as I was sitting with Dr. Hendrickson, this brilliant scholar, I'm 30 years old, I'm just starting to be, do a little Bible teaching, a little speaking here and there. I found myself just full of questions. I had read his commentary in Galatians. I was teaching a Sunday school class on Galatians, and I wanted to ask him just a ton of questions. So I peppered him for the first 45 minutes of our hour-long lunch conversation by saying, what is, the, what is the other gospel that in chapter 1 Paul was so upset about, and what does it mean for a sex addict to live in the freedom of Christ that Paul talks about standing in the freedom and staying free in the freedom that you have in Christ? And I kept asking him all these questions, and he patiently responded. But I noticed as he responded to my brilliant questions, he didn't seem all that excited. Then as it approached the time to leave the table, his, his mood shifted. And this giant of the faith, this brilliant scholar, leaned across the table. He put his hand on mine. I'll never forget this moment. I thought about it again last Monday. And with moist eyes and a trembling voice, he whispered, Larry, you have, you, you have so many questions, but, but you're missing the center. And then he said, almost choking back the words, he said, Larry, I think I'm just beginning to understand the gospel. And again, in my youthful arrogance, I remained silent, but I thought, what's your problem? Did God put me here to straighten you out on the gospel? Isn't it kind of simple? We sinned, Jesus died, we're forgiven, let's get busy and change our world until Jesus comes to finish the job, and then heaven forever. That's the gospel. What don't you get about that, Dr. Hendrickson? Well, I reflected last Monday in those two conversations, and I tried to put into words their lingering effect on my own thinking, and Dr. Hendrickson's comment set me on a path of realizing something I want to say to you this morning. There's more to the gospel than any of us sees. There's more to what the gospel means than any of us are going to ever comprehend. There's always more. And Dr. Knox's sentence that he was not overwhelmed by the suffering so much as he was overwhelmed by the fact that God does anything about it, that sentence, as I remembered last Monday, still jolts me with the realization, now listen carefully, with the realization that I actually, to this day, after knowing Jesus for almost 60 years, there's something in me that still prefers a false gospel to the true gospel. Something in me would rather follow with Jesus who uses his power to solve all these problems, guarantee good marriages, provide great ministries, give me really good friends, fill me with the kind of joy that I want to feel. I want to follow the kind of Jesus that gives me all that I think I need to feel alive. I'd rather follow that kind of Jesus who is going to help me make the world a better place to live than the Jesus who is using his power to make me a better person in this messed up world. You know, I sometimes struggle, even after all these years, with thinking, I'm doing all right. What's this better person stuff? Sanctification, I'm doing all right. I've never had an affair. I don't get drunk. I don't watch pornography. I don't use drugs. I guess I'm sanctified. I guess I'm doing all right. 
But 36 years after my conversation with Dr. Hendrickson, 20 years after talking with Dr. Knox, after 40 years of counseling and 60 years of following Jesus, almost 60 years, but 60 years of living, I realize now looking back with unmet desires and unsolved struggles, I think I'm just beginning to understand the gospel. As never before, I'm getting a painful glimpse of the radical self-centeredness that still energizes so much of how I relate. I'm recognizing what I've come to call relational sin. I don't do all the big bad things, but I wonder if when I relate to my wife of 44 years, I wonder how often something in me basically is saying, honey, do you understand my needs right now matter more than yours, so why don't you get with it and take care of me? Don't you understand that there are struggles within me and I need your encouragement? And if you don't give it to me, I have kind of a right to protect myself from you and to back off a little bit. I see myself as so often as more needy than sinful, more hurt than selfish, more wounded than self-centered. But I'm coming to see relational sin in a whole different category. I believe one of the great weaknesses of our Christian culture is we so often see the, the cross as the place where Christ suffered to relieve suffering, to call me to give my life to relieve suffering in this world as my top priority. To see people's pain that cries out for relief as, my, as, as more important than their need for forgiveness. In the mid-90s, Richard Niebuhr, a theologian, looked at the American church and he described the gospel that he was hearing preached in so many of the evangelical churches in America in the mid-90s. He described the gospel that we so often preach in these following often quoted words. You might have heard them before. Listen to them again. This is the gospel that Niebuhr heard us preaching just 15, 20 years ago. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministration of a Christ without a cross. As Martin Luther finished writing his 95 theses that God used in large measure to recover the true gospel, Luther wrote these words toward the end of the writing of his, th of his theses. He said this, away then, away with all those who say to the people of God, peace, peace when there is no peace, and blessed be those prophets who say to the people of God, the cross, the cross. I guess I sometimes worry that the Christianity we preach and practice provides what God and Jeremiah called superficial healing helping people feel better without moving them onto the narrow road that leads to the life of rela relational holiness formed like Jesus. I sometimes wonder if the greatest mistake that I can make as a Christian counselor is to depend on my training, my theory, my technique to do for my client what I think they most need. <laughs> my mind goes back to when I first began in private practice, a story I've told before, it occurs to me now, a guy came in to see me when I was in full-time practice as a psychologist and he sat down in my office and I began the session the way I always begin a session. I, I know how to begin a session. After that, I'm totally confused for the next hour. But I said to the guy, I said, how can I help you? Now, what he said in response to me was, um, I want to feel better quick. So I, in true empathic style, said, so if I'm hearing you right, you're wanting to feel better quick. And he said, yeah, I think you're getting it, Doc. What do you recommend? I said, you want to feel better quick, what do I recommend? Huh. Well, best I can think of, if you want to feel better quick, I'd suggest you get a case of your favorite alcoholic beverage, get a couple of immoral women, go to the Bahamas for a month. And he looked at me and he said, are you a Christian? I said, why do you ask? He said, that doesn't sound very Christian to me. And I said, but it is. There are pleasures in sin for a season. Jesus calls us to suffer for the sake of his kingdom. And if you want to feel better quick, I recommend sin. But if you want to know life, then I recommend repentance and walking with the Lord. Wonder what we're thinking when we're talking with each other about how to, 
how to maneuver, how to make things better, how to manage relief in our own life, and how to provide relief all over the place. Uh, I wonder if, if, if I'm really as aware as I need to be uh, of how the deep change that God wants to produce in my soul, because I have so much more to change than has already been changed in all of my years of knowing Jesus, if I, do I realize that, 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 the, that the mystery of God's work in my soul is not manageable by me, it really depends on the Spirit of God doing His thing? To whatever degree I'm beginning to understand the gospel, and it feels so very limited, to that degree I'm living every day with a devastating and wearying awareness of my own relational sin. But I'll tell you this, I've never more strongly valued the forgiving power of the blood of Christ, and I've never more strongly depended on the power of his, erection, his resurrection to live a new way, to live like the Lord Jesus. And the more I'm obsessed with Christ, the more other-centered I'm going to become and the more I'm going to be overwhelmed with what God has done for sinful people like me and the more I'm going to want to become a missional Christian, the more I'm going to want to become moving into other people's lives to do whatever kind of help I can, I can provide. But I, I sometimes think that maybe, maybe we get more excited about outward missional activity than inward sanctification because outward missional activity is manageable. We can do it, we can organize it, we can arrange for it, where the kind of change that God longs to produce in us is something that we really don't know how to maneuver very well because have you, all, have you all come to the full realization, I'm sure most of you have, that there really are no formulas in how to change. That's a lesson which comes hard, at least to me. We have two sons, our older son is 42, younger son is 40. And our older son was the one that gave us fits. He rebelled beginning at age 15. He broke our hearts. He scared us to death and doing all sorts of things I didn't like at all. He went to Taylor University, a Christian school in the boondocks of Indiana. Chuck Colson said, send your kids to Taylor University. It's 50 miles from the nearest sin. I think it was until my son got there. Because he really screwed up big time. He was kicked out of Taylor. He was kicked out the week after I had presented the spiritual enrichment lecture series at Taylor University. That was a great time for me. I wanted to see my son change. I wasn't thinking about how I needed to change as a dad. I wanted the formula, the procedure that was going to get my son changed the way he needed to be changed. I wanted to go on a mission to change my son and figure out the strategies to do it rather than look in the mirror and saying, I wonder how I failed as a father. I wonder what God wants to do through me to move toward my son in different kinds of ways. And it was around that time that I happened to have lunch with a, a guy that was maybe in his early 30s. And as we had lunch together and we were getting acquainted, I just found myself so impressed by this, this gentleman as a a deeply mature, spiritually man, mature way beyond his years, and I was intrigued by that, and I said, tell me, tell me your spiritual journey, tell me your story, how did you come to Christ, and how has God been maturing you, how has he been forming you, because I wanted to figure it out so I could apply it to my son. And he told me, he said, well, when I was a teenager, I was a real rebel, and he began to describe my son in his life. I was into drinking and drugs and all sorts of bad things, and one night, when I was about 18 years old, this gentleman was telling me over lunch, I, I, I came home about 2 in the morning, and I wanted to make sure I didn't wake up my parents because I didn't want to get a lecture and be yelled at and all that. So I kind of snuck in the front door quietly and closed it very gingerly quietly and walked down the hallway to my bedroom, had to walk past my parents' bedroom, and I was drunk. And as I walked by my parents' bedroom, I just happened to notice in my drunken stupor that their, the door to their bedroom was open about halfway, and there was a light on, and I could hear a sound coming from within about 2 in the morning. So I was kind of intrigued for whatever reason, and I kind of peeked my head in uh, quietly so he would, they wouldn't notice what I was doing. And the light was on, and I saw my mother. She was kneeling by the bed, and she was crying, softly crying and praying out loud. I listened to my mom. She had no idea I was there. And she was praying, Lord, save my son. He doesn't know you, Jesus. He's ruining his life. Bring him to the cross. Save my son, please, Lord. And that just broke my heart. I went to my room. I got on my knees. I trusted Christ. And I've given my life to him. And I'm growing as best I know how to be become the solid Christian that I long to be. And I'm hearing that and I'm thinking, that might work. So I waited for my next opportunity. Came that very night. 
My son wasn't home by curfew. He was 18 years old. He came in about 2 in the morning, and I'm thinking, God is setting this up perfectly. I heard him open the door. My wife and I were in our bedroom. She was asleep. As soon as I heard the door open, I got out of bed. I opened the door halfway. I turned on the light. I got on my knees. And as I heard him approaching, I began to whimper. <laughs> Dear Lord, save, save, my, save my son. And I heard him walk by, thinking he's going to poke his head in and get saved. He walked right by. So I cried louder. Hey, Lord, do something. He went to bed, had a hangover the next morning. It wasn't changed at all. Darn it. God, will you just tell me what to do? I thought this might work. Would you help me figure out what to do to, to change my son? And something inside of me came alive shortly after that as I began to realize that the one thing I wasn't doing was dealing with my own relational sin, my own demand, my own pressure to make my son my God, to make him change so I could feel good about myself, to make him change so I could feel like a successful Christian leader, to make him change so I could have a better reputation as a good psychologist. I wasn't facing my relational sin. And when he got expelled from Taylor, I drove down to be with him. I got the news he was expelled from Taylor. I was on the road speaking at a conference the next morning when I got the news that night that he was being expelled from Taylor. The next morning I was scheduled to give a three-hour lecture on parenting. I think it was the first humble lecture I ever gave in my life. Next day I drove, I, I flew home, I gave a lecture, I flew home, I went down to Taylor University and I really had a sense the Lord was saying, Larry, you've tried pressure long enough, how about trying grace? And I asked my son when I saw him, he was waiting for the storm, the wrath of his father to come, but he didn't get it. I said, how can I help you? He began to cry. We went out for, to a private place, and he began confessing more sins than I ever wanted to hear. That day he came to Christ. May I suggest to you that only in brokenness over your relational sin will you discern, will you discover God's power in your passion to change the world. Let me summarize all that I feel is on my heart to say to you as we wrap up my talk today. Don't be afraid to face your failure. Enter the mystery of darkness in your own soul because it's there. And it's more than discouraging, it's hopeless. Face how jealous you sometimes are, how insecure you can be, how self-protective you sometimes are, how your unholy lusts can be so strong, how mad you sometimes can be. Because the more, honestly, you enter the mystery of the darkness in your own soul, the more you'll discover your center where the mystery of God's forgiving grace and painful love is alive within you. And the more you discover the center, the more God will use you to bring his kingdom of radical other-centeredness into the lives of others. Maybe by organizing a mission trip to Soweto. Maybe by more sacrificially being there for your roommates. Maybe by wanting to reveal God's glory more than you want to get what you think you need. It's always difficult to speak to a large group because I'd much rather stop right now and talk to a dozen of you and say, what are you hearing? I'd love to stop right now and just go around each of you and say, are you aware that the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus is needed as powerfully today as it was the day you got saved? Are you aware that if you look deeply in your life, you'll recognize that every moment of every day, just like me, you're falling short of the glory of God, falling short of the glory of the relational God because you're not loving with total purity? And are you aware that you're, you're still absolutely forgiven in the middle of all the darkness that you're entering? Are you aware of all that? And are you aware then that Jesus is everything and somehow you come to him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and you begin to love him as you love nobody else and nothing more and somehow the power of Jesus begins to seep into your life and you begin to become a changed person, and as you change some, you say, how did this happen? You didn't manage it. You didn't pull it off. It's something God has done. And then you become alive with the glove of God, and you want to go out and be a missional Christian because 
You've got to be changing before you can change the world. Father, I pray that as, you, as you've guided me, I trust in the words that I've been saying, that whatever your purposes are for maybe just a couple of people right now who are listening to these words, that you'll help us to be more amazed by the wonderful grace of Christ and just stunned by the fact that to see us people that have turned against you and have shaken our fist against you for failing us and the wonder that you've bothered to do anything about our condition, and that you've done everything about our condition. You've seen our worst need is not our suffering, but our worst need is our sin, and you've forgiven it. And the day is coming when you're going to relieve our suffering forever. Keep us faithful until that day, living for you, being changed by you, so we can be your instruments in changing the world and to bring the kingdom into this desperately needy world, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.